I believe the most important thing that we can do as human beings is to know ourselves and to love ourselves. I uh, had the sneaking hunch somehow as we began all this self-congratulatory bicentennial uh, celebration that uh, the two groups who would inevitably be left out would be God and the Indians. <laughs> and I thought it might just be appropriate to do at least one program this year uh, with a real Indian, uh, just in honor of the fact that uh, this is really their country. We'll be right back with Sashin Little Feather, and I believe, and you, I hope. <laughs> if only you believe like I No, no, I, what I'd like to start with is the whole Marlon Brando thing, just to get it out of the way, because I think that's most people, <laughs> because there were, what, like 80 million people mm -hmm. watching you refuse Marlon Brando's Academy Award. That's kind of the, you know, your debut uh, to the mass audience. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that was, uh, what that was all about? Because I know there was some confusion there, and it, it was supposed to have meant one thing very spiritual and beautiful to you and it turned got turned around and meant oh something yeah else. definitely got turned around it got uh, completely misinterpreted for what it was originally I mean as far as myself um, I consulted with some Indian medicine people who to me are very very sacred people and mm -hmm. I prayed with him and I uh, went to mass and Holy Communion too and received the sacraments I'm also Catholic and I prayed very, very hard, and I fasted, and I gave it a lot of thought about the truth had to be spoken. I prayed to the Great Spirit, and I asked him that his spirit might dwell in mine, and that we might become one. And then at that point, when I spoke, those would be his words, the words that um, a Catholic learns at confirmation. The words of the Great Spirit are not afraid to speak the truth. It's always proud of speaking the truth, yes. no matter how it's taken by the people, because the truth can never be denied, and it's just that, a fact. Well, why wasn't the truth? If the truth was spoken, was it... Because people have a way of, of living an existence that is not based on truth, and therefore they question other people when they speak because uh, they thought you were showboating or showboating or egotistical or some type of phony or something like that in other words some people because of what they are themselves chose not to believe me and that again is their prerogative but what it was for me was a very spiritual event I had prayed for it um, to, to come across in a very truthful fashion I had prayed to God that he might be with me that night and I had also consulted with the medicine people mm -hmm. so that they might give me the encouragement uh, in the Native American way to say something and not to be harsh or unkind. What did you want to say briefly? Because that you just had a very brief time then. Can you uh -huh. say again now, either in those words or other <clears throat> words, the, the single message that, that you, as an Indian, wanted to communicate to? Well, very basically, I think it's true for most people. That is that the image of our race has... Uh, not been one of, of truth and dignity and honor as far as uh, films go, as far as the mass media has made out the Indian to be. You know, um, we are portrayed as, as ignorant uh, savages, uh, uh, most definitely in most of the films mm -hmm. past and still at present. And uh, our image has been one of a drunk or, or, or one of a, of a lesser secondary citizen. And I feel that you know, to that audience that night that I wanted to tell them that we did have this stereotype mm -hmm. and uh, that they were going to in some way have to open up their minds and their hearts and begin to understand that if the media was used negatively against the Native American, then we could all pull together and help the uh, media to, to make a sta uh, positive stand toward the sure. Native American, making it positive, the image positive once again. 
um, enlighten itself sure. or ourselves. So you itself. see, if the tube creates a negative image, it can be used to create a positive image, sure. very basically. Yeah. I, I think, personally, with the, what drove it home to me, <clears throat> I suppose there, there's a buildup of things, and for some people it was Watergate, and for some, for me it was Southeast Asia, when I found out that gradually the realization dawned that we were the bad guys, that we were the aggressors, uh, that we weren't wanted, that this wasn't a just or moral cause or war. But the media had said, and, and our government, our leaders had said, this is a good thing. I was reminded of the cowboy and Indian stereotype. Well, you see, where the cowboy wore the white hat <clears throat> and the Indian was the... I'm not into uh, politics. That's something else that's been misinterpreted. A, mm -hmm. a, a woman who's a militant, uh, a woman who uh, trots out their front door in the morning with a gun or something, you know. I mean, uh, I might trot out in the morning with some good words for people, but, you know, that's, uh, I'm not the type of person that, that, uh, that is out a as a as an all in all militant. In fact, you rather turned off to groups like <clears throat> AIM and other political caucuses that, that use violence. Well, the utilization of violence uh, provokes violence, but I feel that there are greater ways that that uh, Indian people can can serve the community and and uh, can really make a dent. Uh, if a person. Uh, for example, the, the, the textbook is a sign of the new warrior. Uh, getting a college degree, whether it mm. be in law or medicine or whatever, uh, this is a s very significant contribution. Sure. We need uh, a lot of Indian people in the media, television reporting, producing, directing, uh, camera people, etc., so that we can also add uh, what we have to offer to the media in order to help change our own image. We need Indian filmmakers, uh, both documentary and uh, entertainment films. Uh, we need more Indians in every profession. Sashin, I want to get to that in the context of you, because you, you're the one I really care about. But, uh, but, but just to clarify this thing, if there are people outside who accused you of showboating and say, well, you're piggybacking <laughs> your Indian blood, you know, to, to, to get some sort of exposure or recognition, there must also be people within the Indian community, these 300 plus tribes who resent you and, you know, consider you phony. And yet, <laughs> well, I saw you Saturday night at the powwow oh, at the in powwow. San Leandro, yeah. very warmly received by people. Now, maybe there are detractors as well. I didn't see that. People who <laughs> were jealous or resentful. How, how do you handle that? Oh, that's, um, I don't know, it just, it, it's, it goes on forever and ever. You see, there's nobody that really dislikes an Indian as much as another Indian. <laughs> and um, we have considerable backstabbing within our own race as well. Um, You're Apache. Yeah, Apache. White Mountain Apache. I'd like to just say a little bit about uh, my particular tribe. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then ask you to give me some answers. First of all, who were the people that conquered the Indians in the Southwest, California, New Mexico, and Arizona? Who were the people? The Spaniards. Right, the Spaniards. And under the domination of uh, the Spaniards, uh, the Indian people were forced into a servitude, um, and we built the missions, and uh, we served the Spanish, and we adopted some of their ways and their foods and habits, naturally. We were enculturated into, into their society, and uh, they baptized us into Catholicism. And you will notice that many of our tribes of California and the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, we have Spanish last names. My family's name is Cruz, C-R-U-Z. Our tribal chairman's name is Ron Lupe. And we have other Apaches with names like Garcia and Torres and Martinez and so forth down the line. Mm -hmm. Because at the time when the Spanish were conquering peoples of our tribe, an ethnocentric ego, they weren't going to give us French names. They gave us their names, these Spanish this names. This was an intermarriage, you're saying? they. No, they, they superimpose these names upon us. And so we have a right to go either by our family name or we have a right to go by our Indian name, which is usually given us by an older person of the tribe or someone within our own family. 
and uh, it can be something that is associated with us personally. That's Little Feather for you? Is little that Feather. How that drives? Because I know Sashin is, right. is a nickname almost. Of That's family, my nickname, right, you know. uh, of my family. Um, before I became Little Feather, I was Sashin Cruz. And then after I was given my Indian name, Jagi Bisidae, which means Little Feather, I went by that. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's no mystery to this at all. Uh, there's no hype. Uh, there's no phoniness behind it. It's simply uh, a misinterpretation by other people who really are not educated to understand Native Americans. And uh, How do you handle the mix of the, of the two, the fact that you can be Roman Catholic and... <laughs> and Indian and sort of, you know, harmoniously um, incorporate the two. You'd speak of the divine spirit and the father, one and the same. And of course... I, I, think, I think really they run really close together. Um, I'm really amazed that the closeness of religious beliefs, you know, and the values that they have uh, between them. Um, this is only my personal belief and I don't speak for anybody else. Um, I find a lot of joy in attending sweat lodge ceremonies, for example, in my Native American sweat, re sweat lodge ceremonies sweat lodge. in my Native American religion, and uh, that is a place to me that that means quite a bit. Ceremonies conducted by a medicine person, um, where we we enter into a sweat lodge and we pray together, and as we sweat, we sweat out the impurities of our spirits, so to speak. It's like a, a sauna? A it gets hot like a sauna bath, but there's more to it than that. It's a very, very spiritual uh, event, and it's not taken lightly at all. Yeah. The person must make preparation in fasting and in prayer before he goes in. He must openly, or she must openly confess to the other people you know, the wrongdoings that we have done to one another, sort of like an open confession. Yeah. And then we are given words of consolation. Consul consolation. Uh, consolation, right. And also words of, 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 of tremendous wisdom and thought by the medicine person conducting the, uh, the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And as we sweat, it gets to uh, an unbearable type of heat where you almost feel at one point that you might pass out, but you don't. And you pray for the great spirit as you sweat and sweat till there is nothing more to pour out of your body, that you might receive the great spirit, that he might enter into your soul and into your heart, and that you can be this one with him. And it is, in fact, a communion. It is, in fact, close to a Catholic communion. Once you have received him in this fashion, it is the greatest joy that I have ever experienced and the greatest, greatest source of peace of mind and beauty to be with all of these women in this sweat lodge in traditional fashion as our people have done for centuries and centuries and to know and love and feel one another in this sweat lodge ceremony, openly confessing, openly sweating and receiving together is perhaps one of the most beautiful experiences of my whole existence. I mean, I feel that the Native American religion is the most modern of any religion today. So fervently do I believe that. And one of the great things about uh, our race of people is that we are so old. Anthropologists have found the bones of Indian people to be up to 40,000 years old. So you must know that if people conceive the Chinese to be very wise and very deep within their, their, their tremendous wisdom that they have to offer and get to give to people, that we also, in our thousands of years of existence, have this tremendous knowledge and this tremendous wisdom that are our laws to live by. And uh, so she, speaking of suffering, I, I just I didn't even want to interrupt. That was so moving, and I could I could almost feel the experience. But it is a, you've spoken before of discipline and self control, and this is a kind of purification that derives in part from suffering. Mm -hmm. I I wish that you would s share some well, of the suffering. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go back if if we can to to your life. Do you mind sharing some of that? Because I don't think people realize what, that, well, that you just had lung surgery in the last couple of months. But even more important, the, the psychological suffering that has been yours since childhood. The, well, you know, uh, tormented and outcast and 
thing. Do you mind sharing some of that? I, I, have, I have one thing that I would like to say, and that is regards, I opened up the show that I believe that you must know yourself and that you must love yourself. Now, recently, I did have lung surgery. It was very, very severe and very serious, and it, it happened all of a sudden. It was one of those type of things. There was no forewarning at all. I have had tuberculosis when I was a child, and um, it Sorry. sort of preempted a lung surgery recently two months ago in which I'm still recuperating. Uh, however, I, I was also given the last rites of the Catholic Church on April the 2nd, 1976. And um, when another patient entered my room and she had cancer and I had this lung thing, uh, I looked at her and I was sort of sedated with all of the medicine that they had given me. And I looked up from my bed and my eyes met her. And the, the question that I, ans I asked her is, do you like yourself? Do you like yourself? And she looked at me and she says, I don't know. With almost tears were in her eyes. And I looked at her and I said, nothing at all. I just stared. And then I began to ask myself the same question. Do I like myself? Do I love myself? Because that's the only thing that is going to help me to get well. That's the only thing that's going to make my lung heal. It's the only thing that was going to make my spirit heal so I could be a whole person again. There are many different elements that entered into liking myself. I underwent a, a, a tremendous um, child abuse when I was younger from my parents, especially my father. And it hurt me very, very deeply. Who was your dad was um, a deaf mute, is that? Right. And, but aside from that, my father was a very ill person, very psychologically ill. And the physical and the sexual abuse that he inflicted at a very, very young age made me feel that I was unworthy of love. And I know that there are many, many children whose parents, when they inflict pain upon them, they feel that they are not worthy of love. <laughs> if you conceive yourself to be a bad person uh, because your parents, your first associates, teach you that you're bad, you're not worthy of being loved, then it is difficult in life to actually like yourself. You bet. <laughs> very, very hard. And also the prejudice factor, too. You know, if people look down upon you, in your growing up years, it makes you feel that you're not as good as the next person. And I think that many of us, many Native Americans, especially in today's society, have an inferiority complex because we have been treated with severe prejudice. There are times when we were not allowed to go to um, certain, you know, stores or we were treated with disdain Mm -hmm. uh, in places and by people and so forth are called names. And this hurts, you know, a lot. So it's hard to build up a self-confidence and a self-love meeting against these elements. You know, there are a lot of Indian people who are Catholic, you know, uh, and a lot of my, my Indian friends are Catholic, a lot of Pueblos and uh, Pimas uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Mohawks and so forth. And we've had tremendous discussions about in the areas of, of loving ourselves. We realize that our parents made a lot of errors with, with us. I, I know that during my lifetime I've suffered tremendous pain, and I know that I've grown as a result of it. And I've thought of it in relationship to a mother. A mother who's pregnant suffers a lot of pain in giving birth to her child. But from that comes a new life that is truly beautiful. What for you, Sashin, if you, you've experienced marriage, which is often a turning point five years ago. Somebody loved you that much and you someone else. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you also experienced tremendous uh, psychological pressure, even to the point of nervous breakdown and, and oh, yes. an institution for a year. And so for <laughs> what, and, and yet friends and acclaim and some recognition. What in all of those experiences enabled you if any, to turn a corner, to begin to love and respect yourself as a person? Uh, the greatest turning point was uh, when I, I, I was a, a suicide victim um, somewhere, I guess, around six years ago or seven years ago. 
And uh, I had a nervous breakdown. I suffered uh, uh, tremendously from mental illness and from wanting to do myself in. It was a matter of things of, that had gone on in my lifetime for years and years and years and years, and my never being able to speak of it with anyone. And finally, I was found myself in a mental institution, and uh, I had to sign myself in. That was one of the most difficult things that I ever had to do in my whole life, was realizing that the illness and the severity of it was so great that I could not function in the outside world, as we called it. If you've ever seen the movie called The Cuckoo's Nest with Jack Nicholson, that's just about exactly what it's like. There's always a nurse ratchet within every institution. We had ours. And the suffering in those places and the suffering personally that I went through manifests itself not only psychologically but physically too, with swollen fingers or strawberry rashes on the body or things like migraine headaches or... Uh, All the psychosomatic, of course. Well, you know, not, like I know for a while when I was there, I was not able to recognize my relatives. I was not able to recognize my own face in the mirror. I was simply that far out. And the reality of never knowing if I would be ever coming back to the world again, if anybody, you know, could do anything for me at that time, I suppose they tried, but I really knew that the answer to getting well again was within myself. I have to and interrupt for just a minute. I, I, I believe. <laughs> I'm glad you made it back. We'll be right back with you and Sashi and Little Brother. <laughs> Well, let's pick, pick it up right there, where you're finding the answer within yourself, in the in Agnes, right? The right. Mental right. Institution. Mental institution. Right. Um, the the greatest the greatest uh, thing there was was looking inward to myself, and again asking myself that basic question, you know, uh, do I love myself? Do I like myself? I know the answers to my illness are within me. Please, God, please, please help me find these answers because I'm sick and I need your help. And I ask so sincerely every day, every minute, I, that, I, that I couldn't ask anymore. My whole life was centered around getting well getting out of this place, this terrible place that I was in. And somehow, somewhere, someone heard me. And I did make it out. And I did get well. But I'm only 25% of a former uh, mental patient that would make it out of such an institution. 75% of the patients never get out. Never leave. Because they always, in their lives, find that they have to return. And it's, it's, it's definitely a place where I grew and where I suffered tremendously. Anyone who's ever had any type of mental afflictions knows how terrible and, 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 and how, how terribly painful it is, excruciating. But I made it out of there, and I found that afterwards I was a much stronger person, and I was able to give so much more. And there was, there was no humiliation that was too great for me. 
after that because I had been in the pit. And you know when you're in that, that, that den of darkness that there's only one way and that's up. And gradually there began to be some light in my life and there began to be some good people and lots of positive thoughts. And I said to myself when I, when I walked forward out of that institution, please help me make it, please. I think I've got a chance. And if I can give something to people along the way, help me to give what I can. And I sort of grew from that and matured tremendously and began to see life in, a, in an overall new way, you know, like coming back from the dead. And I say, you know, that I'm lucky for my sufferings. I'm lucky for my pain because I've grown from it. And I think that I have a lot to contribute, you know, to people at large. If I think it's interesting that, this, that physical suffering and psychological suffering would lead you not to, to run, not to cop out, but to a deeper spiritual faith. And, you know, the Christian and the Indian faiths are very similar there, and they teach respect for creation, and including ourselves as created in the image and likeness of God. It's, it's true. I think that we are. I am beginning, after all of these years, to really begin to know myself once again and to, to want to be able to, to give once again as much as I'm able. And the reason I believe this is because there is someone up there, the Great Spirit or God or whatever you want to call him, that is letting me live. And I must be alive for some reason. And the reason can't be a purely selfish one, because I don't believe that God is selfish. That's neat. That's, um, I think, a, a very appropriate um, summation of you and this half hour you're sharing. And ever so coincidentally and appropriately, this bicentennial year, which uh, it looks like we snuck in, didn't we? <laughs> Thanks for sneaking in and, and oh, for sharing thank yourself you. so openly. And I, I know that when somebody speaks that honestly, it touches others. It's and very honest. I don't, can't speak way. any other way. That's neat. <laughs> Thanks, Ashin. Thank you all. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Happy bicentennial. So would I